In the next series of videos, I'm going to be explaining to you some things about dark matter. Now, this is something that's right at the forefront of physics. This is where, you know, what our understanding about physics is uh, can help us to explain, well, why this stuff is so weird, but we don't really necessarily know that much about dark matter. So maybe you can figure it out and you'll probably get the Nobel Prize if you can, because this is, this is stuff that's brand new. So we're going to be using our laws of physics and the things that we've been looking at in the past, so things like our basic laws of mechanics and orbital mechanics, and we're going to try to take a look at those and how those predict certain things, and we're going to see then that uh, things aren't exactly as expected. So first of all, I think the important question is, well, how can we detect something that we can't see? We call this stuff dark matter. So how in the world can we actually detect it then? Well, the trick is here that we use our laws of physics to infer. So again, like what we were doing before, we're going to infer its existence. And I'll explain this. So we're going to use things that seem logical, things that we understand. We're going to try to sort of infer the existence of dark matter. Now, the way we're going to do this, I think I'm going to try something a little bit different here, because um, the, the thing is that you know, we, we're going to take a look at um, an interesting situation, I think, or sort of a, a different way of looking at things. So let's, let's take a little aside here. So instead of talking about dark matter, I'm going to talk to you about this. This is a picture of the Earth taken at night. Obviously, it's not taken at the same time because uh, the Earth and half of the Earth is in the sunlight and half is in the darkness. But let's say you put all together, all together, the dark sort of pictures here of the Earth, and this is what here what you get. So this is, you know, for example, uh, the United States. This is South America. This is Europe, uh, India, and so on, and Africa, and Australia, and Japan. So this is obviously you see the lights uh, that are on at night. Now my question to you is, just imagine if you're some sort of alien being and you visited Earth only and you only saw the dark side of it. So you only saw sort of this type of picture. What kind of information could you infer from this? And I think that you could, you could expect, okay, well from this we could tell, for example, that there's certain things that exist. For example, you could say, oh, I see the United States, I see, you know, South America, maybe I see the Caribbean, I see Florida, I see Spain, I see, you know, wherever it is you're looking, or Denmark, where I'm living now, wherever it is you look, you might be able to infer the existence of these things. Great. But here's the problem, though, of course, we're not seeing everything. So if we looked at this picture, if we were some sort of alien, and this is all we saw, we'd be missing a lot of the story. I hope you can see that you know there's a lot of these things that aren't shown here. For example, these dark patches here. These are here are some oceans. So this is the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and we're missing you know really important things like well, I'd like to think this is really important, like Canada, where I'm from. There's not much of Canada shown here. Well, because Canada is very big, but most of the Canadians live in this tiny little sort of area here near the United States. So for example, you wouldn't know that Canada existed, or you wouldn't know that there's much in Australia, or you wouldn't know that, you know, there's oceans here, or that there are mountains here. So my point is just that looking at this one picture, you'd be missing a lot of information. And this is the idea I'm going to use to explain dark matter. The idea is going to be this. We can only look at things that we can see. This is the important thing. So what can we actually see? When we look up in the night sky, we see lots of stars. So for example, you know, this is a star, and this is a star, and this is a star, and so on, right? There's lots and lots of stars. Now the stars give off light. So the stars emit light. Maybe I'll say that instead. So stars are actually light sources. So this is something, if we looked up in the sky, we would see this. We see lots of stars. Okay. Well, what else can we see? Well, we can see galaxies. And galaxies are just lots of stars. Well, plus gas. There's lots of gas. So, for example, this is the Andromeda galaxy. This is a common picture on, uh, for example, Apple computers whenever they're showing sort of a demo. They often use this picture, but this is just a really nice picture of our nearest large galaxy. This is the Andromeda galaxy. It's uh, thought to be very similar to our own Milky Way. In fact, we're headed towards each other. But this galaxy here, this beautiful thing right here, well, you see the light from lots of stars and you see dust. 
well dust is just a lack of stars uh, but you see gas because there's also hot gas here but the main thing behind galaxies is well lots of stars and of course then we see lots of hot hydrogen gas this is a beautiful picture this is actually something uh, so here I'll say that the uh, hydrogen gas uh, let's say here it uh, heats up we could say and gives off light so it emits light maybe I'll say that again here instead of gives off that's not very uh, technically correct here so it emits light Okay, so what was happening inside a star, so for example, like this star here and this star here, there's nuclear fusion going on at its core, and so there's a lot of energy being given off. Every time one of these elements is being made, there's energy being released, and some of that energy is in the form of light, which then travels through lots of light years and gets to us. And then we have, remember, we have galaxies. Those are just lots of stars, so that light is reaching us. We also have uh, you know, something called a nebula. A nebula is something that sort of looks cloudy in the sky. This is a real picture. It's taken uh, as a composite of different wavelengths, but when you put it together, and if you you know apply you know reds to the red colors and green to the green colors and so on, uh, it would probably look very similar to this if you were actually there. This is actually called the Eagle Nebula. That's what the name of this thing is. Well, this is actually a part of the Eagle Nebula. It turns out this is actually, uh, this is nicknamed the Pillars of creation. I think it's kind of a nice name for it. And that's because it turns out this gas, this hydrogen gas, which is hot, is giving off light. That's another thing that can give off light. And so what I, I mainly want to point out is that the things that we see then in the sky when we look up are only things that emit light. Well, then you might think about this picture. That's another common one used in Apple commercials. So why then do things like planets and the moon seem bright in the sky? I mean, this, if you look at the Earth, for example, it doesn't actually give off much light, and yet it looks bright. Or if we look in the sky, we can see, for example, Venus or Mars. They look very bright in the sky. And hopefully you can think of it. That's why I put this picture. Because the sunlight, the sun, which is actually emitting light, bounces off the surface of the planet. So I'll say that. So that's because of reflection. So most... Most uh, planets and moons and things like that are actually not emitting light. They're only reflecting it. So they're not true light sources. Uh, that being said, there are some exceptions. For example, if it's massive enough, like Jupiter, it actually has its own internal uh, heat source, which is actually giving off some light. But that's a different uh, question altogether. So my whole point is that when we look then at things, we can only see in the sky what gives off light. Okay, that's the main point I want to take a look at. Okay, so we can only see what gives off light. Maybe I'll put that down here. So the conclusion here, you know, we can only see things that emit light. I say or reflect. So or reflect light. So this is sort of that's what we do in physics, right? We can only use information that we have. So let's take a look then at things that we have and let's take a look at what we expect to see. So for example here, we can take a look at how galaxies should rotate. So what I mean by that is, uh, let's take a look at, um, so here we would look at the stars and gas in a galaxy. So if we were trying to take a look at each of those, you know, stars and each of the, you know, little gas particles, uh, how should they actually rotate around in a galaxy? How should they actually do that? Well, the stars plus the gas in a galaxy, they should actually rotate um, around. Now, the fact that a galaxy sort of seems to rotate around a point, it doesn't mean that there's one central object and everything has to orbit around that object. Turns out all these things, all the stars and gas, are all attracted to each other, and they're all dancing around in this circle, like some sort of cosmic ballet here. So we don't need, we don't need a central object. But now, if, now this is the key thing here, we're gonna use our laws of physics. So if we assume, and we're right to assume this, we're right to assume Keplerian orbits. Remember what that means. If something you know is Keplerian, it means it follows Kepler's laws. So something like 
you know, it should be elliptical. Dot dot dot. You know, so orbits like we see things that like everything else we look at, we see things orbiting, and they follow these laws. And these are considered correct. We still don't think these are wrong at all. So if we expect, or if we assume that these stars and gases should be in Keplerian orbits, then we can expect something like this. We can expect then that the force, you know, on one of these particles, so let's say we have the, um, yeah, some sort of central object. Uh, let's just say, I mean, it doesn't really matter what the center is. But let's just say we have something sort of going around in a circle like this. If this here is the particle here, and it's sort of going around, if it's going around like this right here, we could say that it has a certain radius, r, and it'll have a certain mass, m, Maybe I'll make that in green as well, like this right here. And now what would happen is we would expect, now if this is like, if this is orbiting some central object, let's say this is some central object that had a mass m, let's just say, so something that did have a central mass m. Then we would expect, like we've seen before, we would expect to see that the gravitational force, which is equal to g times m times m over r squared, we would expect that the gravitational force of attraction would be equal to the centripetal force, which is mv squared over r. And then what we would do is we would set fg equals fc. I've done this before in the last set of videos, right, when we were looking at uh, weighing um, a star or weighing a black hole. We've just we've looked at this before. There's no sense doing it all in great detail. I'm just going to sort of rush through the derivation here. So we would set these two equal to each other. Therefore, we'd have g m m over r squared would equal m v squared over r. The small m's would cancel out. That tells us that the mass of the thing orbiting doesn't really matter. And what I could do then is maybe move the r over. So then I would have v squared equals. Let's see. It would be g m over r because this r would cancel out one of the ones in the square and therefore i could say that v equals well technically plus or minus but we'll just consider the plus part so square root of g m over r if i want to get rid of the squared it would be this so the key thing to get out of this is this piece right here therefore the velocity should be proportional to 1 over the square root of r. This is sort of the key thing right here. We don't really care about the mass or the uh, gravitational constant. We're just going to say that we expect that the velocity of the particle should be proportional to 1 over r. So we expect the graph of these particles to look like this. Okay, so we're expecting the graph to do something like this. So if this here is the velocity of the particles, this here is the distance or the sort of radius outwards. So this is sort of from the center. If we're looking at, you know, from the center here as we go further out, uh, something that goes one over square root of r looks like this. We would expect to do something like this. This is what's expected. Okay, this is, this is the key thing right here. This is the key sort of piece of information right here is this. We would expect that these particles, or these planets, or these stars, or these gas particles, all this material here, should really be doing this. It should be going, you know, at small r values, you should have large v's, and as you go down, it should go down steeply like this. Now, what do we actually see? We actually see something very, very different. In the next video, I'm going to show you that and explain why it's really weird. <laughs>